How do you qualify for a professional tournament? Who decides whether you're playing main draw or qualifying? Who decides who is seeded? And how do the rankings work anyway? Those are some of the questions that come up when I talk to my clients about pro tennis. And I wanna give you an overview in a very simplified way because yeah, it is actually really interesting and there are some really, yeah, extraordinary scenarios going on right now in both men's and women's that I think lend themselves to be really talked about and they give good examples. And of course, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the WTA tour because that is where I was number 27 in October of 1995. So it's a while ago. And yeah, the rankings determined everything. If anybody tells you that rankings don't matter, yeah, not quite true. I wanna jump into by starting to talk about the tiers and classifications of tournaments. There's the ATP tour, there's the WTA tour, and both now actually have the same titles. The WTA um, made their titles the same as the ATP to make it easier for tennis fans, and these are the classifications of tournaments. And above those tournaments, we have the four Grand Slams, and they are their own animal. On the men's side, it is very true that if you do win a 1,000 level tournament, you are getting 1,000 points. On the women's side, there are some exemptions to it, but roughly, you get that number of points. If you win a Grand Slam, the Australian Open, French Open, Wimbledon, or the US Open, you get 2,000 points. And if you come out of nowhere, like for instance, Emma Raducanu, if you just, just get those 2,000 points, you immediately go to right now, number 23. She's a little higher because she had other results, and I'll get back to that in a little bit. So those are the levels of tournaments. People play those tournaments, they qualify for those tournaments based on one of actually two rankings. And we usually only ever talk about one, and it is the one that computes points that are won depending on the number of rounds you win at all these tournaments that I just mentioned within a 52-week rolling window. On the men's side, your best 19 will be taken. So if you play tournament number 20, and that result is better than your absolute worst of the 19 previous efforts, that last one drops off and you get your rankings up. And on the women's side, it is 16. If you qualify for the year end masters race to the WTA finals or the ATP finals, you actually get one more tournament, that particular tournament also included in your points. So it's 19 plus one on the men's side, 16 plus one on the women's side. And you heard me mention the WTA finals and the ATP finals. That is the second ranking that is being computed. And that starts over January 1st, boom. However many tournaments, no limit that you're playing will get you to a spot in the race two the WTA final or ATP finals ranking. And this is where we have our first very interesting scenario. So I'll go with an example on the men's side. Whereas Novak Djokovic in our regular 52 week rolling window ranking is number one, he is not to be seen in the race to the ATP final because he hasn't played any tournaments for known reasons. Taylor Fritz, on the other hand, who just won Indian Wells, number 13 in the regular rankings, is now in third position in the race to the ATP finals. So those are two different rankings, but only one really matters when it comes to who gets into what tournament and how the seeds are being made. Going back one more time to the WTA and the ATP finals, the best top eight players are playing in singles. On the ATP, there's a little bit of a twist to it. If a current uh, Grand Slam winner is not within number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but between eight and 20 in the rankings, that person, that current Grand Slam winner is actually taken ahead of the actual number eight in the race to the ATP finals ranking. So that's just a little bit different on the women's side, straight up first eight. So let's go back to our rolling window 52 week ranking. 
because that is the interesting one. So the more matches you win at higher rated events, the more points you're getting. So Emma Raducanu won the US Open and she also made it to the fourth round at Wimbledon. So both of those are huge chunks of points. And you're hearing that a lot in commentary on TV. She has a lot of points to defend. She has to defend her title. And we're not just talking about the prize money. We mostly talk about the points because here is what could happen if Emma Raducanu does not back up both of those really good results. The wins at Wimbledon getting into the fourth round catapulted her somewhere from, I believe, 600 in the rankings to 250. She did well at another smaller tournament, but then of course won the US Open out of qualifying, which she qualified for based on whatever her rank was on the cutoff date for that tournament. I'll get into that in a second. And well, the win at the US Open got her from 150 or whatever it was to the top 20. And now she's actually top 15. So that is enormous pressure because if you don't back that up, the whole thing could go in reverse. She could drop easily out of the top 200 because so far she hasn't really done as well in other tournaments to build up her points. So it's much more beneficial for you to build up your ranking by having steady results and not two outliers because the closer you get to those tournaments, the more you feel the pressure. Somebody who just actually experienced that is Sophia Kennan. Remember her? She won the Australian Open in 2020 and made it to the finals of the French Open in 2020. And now there was a little bit of a twist to it because the rankings got frozen both on the ATP and the WTA side because of COVID. So because of that exemption in the rule, her points stayed on, and not just for her, for everybody, stayed on way longer than the regular 52 week window. She didn't do anything in 2021, really, because she was also injured, she had COVID, so she didn't build up any points. And then it hit her when actually this past January, February, she could not defend any points at the Australian Open. She lost in the first round and she dropped out of the top 20 to now 125. And that matters because those rankings, the 52 week rolling window rankings determine whether you are getting into a tournament as a main draw um, admittance or as a qualifier or you don't get in at all. And then you have to look where else you can play. So what players do is they enter several tournaments a week and then there is a cutoff day, usually four weeks ahead of time, at least that's what it was when I played. And then you get to decide, depending on where you are, where you're going to play. And if you're 125, that does not guarantee you a spot, for instance, in the main draw of Miami. And this is where it gets really interesting. So the rankings decide who gets into the main draw, who plays qualifying. The rankings also decide who gets seated at what position. And that is interesting as well because the higher you ranked, the less likely you are to run into other higher ranked players early on. So for instance, this is the Miami Open draw sheet. This is the first time in about 30 years that I've printed a draw sheet out. The top seed is on the very top and the second seed is at the very bottom. So the number one and two seed cannot play each other very early on in these earlier rounds. And yeah, it's just more exciting for better players to be in later rounds and it's more exciting for fans and that is also where the seeding comes from. Of course, it matters who you play early on because let's say if two former world number ones were to play in the second round, wait, what? 
yeah, one of them is not going to go on, of course, and it might not be as exciting later on to not have that player in the draw. But that is exactly what just happened at the Miami Open. As I'm taping this today, Angelique Kerber, former world number one, is playing Naomi Osaka, also former world number one, in the second round. And the reason for that is that Naomi Osaka could not defend her points from the 2021 Australian Open. So 2,000 points, boom, dropped out. She dropped from 14 in the rankings to 73. She still qualified directly, though, for the main draw, but just barely. If you look at the draw sheet from the Miami Open, this is a 128 players roster. And you would think, oh, the first 128 players in the rankings will qualify. No. Miami is an exemption because 32 players have a buy. So that means 128 minus 32. And that means for those 32 players, they have a buy. They don't even have to play the first round, meaning they get the points and the prize money for the second round, which is actually fairly significant these days. So at least there, there has been an increase in prize money. It is still not equal. Nope, don't get me started on that. And no, there are no equal playing opportunities for women as opposed to men because the men have way more tournaments. And whereas the classification of the points is similar, the prize money is nowhere near to equal on different tournaments. So that as a side note. Let's go back to how you get into the main draw. So Naomi Osaka as the number 73 did just barely qualify and she had to play it first round. She won it second round. Now she's facing Angelique Kerber, arguably a way stronger player than let's say a number 45. Just making that up. So if you thought, okay, so it's 96 players that get in because yeah, so many players have a buy. You're wrong because we also have to get some qualifiers in. So 12 women had to win two rounds prior to the main draw to secure their spots in the main draw. Okay, so that is 96 minus 12, 84 direct entries. And we're still not there yet. We have wild cards. So wild cards are given to players who, let's say, were either injured. So for instance, Andy Murray comes to mind or somebody who was a really high ranked player, highly ranked player who has already shown that they belong there like Sophia Kennan. And she got a wild card because as the number 125, she would have had to play qualifying, which a lot of those former really, really good players do not want to do. I have an opinion about that. And the opinion is, I think if you haven't played a whole lot of matches, you should probably play qualifying and some smaller tournaments just to get the match toughness, to have the opportunity to play matches. Because in Sophia Cannon's example, she's played five tournaments so far this year and has lost five first rounds. So the thinking would be play smaller tournaments where the competition is not quite as tough and get your confidence back up. Be that as it may, she got the wild card and actually had to withdraw because of a foot injury. So she really is getting the hammer right, left and center with just bad luck. But that is what a wild card player can be. Another wild card player could be a young and upcoming player. And usually it is the nationality of the tournament that the tournament is just played at. So for instance, at Indian Wells and Miami, a lot of Americans get wild cards. So young and upcoming players who have not had the experience yet and or the ranking points to qualify directly, get the wild card to see what the level of play is. And because of course the expectations or hopes are that at some point they'll reach those tournaments um, under their own steam. So those are the wild cards. So if we thought 84 players, Minus the eight wild cards, we're at 76 players, direct entries, and then it makes more sense that Naomi Osaka barely got in. But then we have one more exemption, 
and it is an exemption. It's called a protected ranking or a special ranking, and that is usually given to players who have been injured for a long time. So, for instance, um, Andy Murray has that protected ranking. On the women's side, there is a player in the draw, the German Lara Siegemund. She had knee surgery, and she is using her protected ranking to play at a higher level right away, although she has also played smaller tournaments to get more match um, opportunities. And the longer you're injured, the more you're actually getting the opportunity to play, the more tournaments you can enter with that special ranking. And it is roughly the same area of ranking where you were when you stopped playing. You have to apply for it. I had to do that when I got injured and I was very, very fortunate that they had that rule because after my first injury break of 22 months, I had completely fallen out of the rankings. So I hope most of this made sense because that is the overview, I guess you want to say, with a couple of twists to the rankings. And I hope you enjoy watching my content. If you do so, please subscribe to my channel, recommend my channel to your friends, and I will see you soon right back here.